Okay, so we're 32 minutes past, so I guess um, we may as well kick off with um, some introductions. Um, but the, I guess the idea of today is to do a little overview of the threat landscape, um, looking obviously back at sort of 23, um, with some, I guess, predictions into, you know, how that may change um, sort of throughout 24, right? So me, myself and Ed, um, just having a little bit of a, a sort of fireside chat, you know, in the sort of homage to, to FDR back in the day on the, on the American radio stations. So as a, as introduction to, to ourselves, um, myself, I, I, I'm Jake, uh, Jake Upfield. I'm the networking security um, solutions specialist here at, uh, at Ultima. Um, so I've, I've worked for six, seven years within the, the cybersecurity sort of industry um, in, a, in a various amount of roles, um, both through this specialist overlay, um, account management C, um, and solutions design, managed services design as well. So, um, you know, fairly well rounded. Um, and I'll let my co host, um, Ed, uh, give a little bit of background to himself. Thanks, Jake. Uh, my name is Ed Rowley. Uh, currently working at Proofpoint, have been for uh, most of the last nine years. Um, been working in cybersecurity since uh, 1999. And um, yeah, thank you for, for having me on the, on the webinar today. Thank you. So um, we've we've split the the uh, I guess the conversation, if you like, up into into three main areas. So um, obviously the one that, that everyone might be very excited about is the the AI side of it, as that's a well we'll, we'll get onto that. But a very a very poignant word within uh, the industry. Um, data loss um, sort of prevention, but equally you know how can you secure your your data? We're not, uh, and then obviously what are gangs you know sort of doing out there Re realistically has it changed much or, or where are they looking to to sort of attack uh, moving forward um we're not planning to sort of solutionize on the call but please do use the questions of the the little box or or however you have it presented to yourselves to, to ask questions and uh, we'll pick them up throughout the uh, the conversation if you like so i wanted to sort of preface this first of all with a you know a bit of a discussion around I guess security as a whole. So um, the sort of latest 2003 reports, uh, uh, sorry, 2023 reports, um, which, which are getting produced from um, multiple sources, are all sort of saying around 85 to 90 percent of um, businesses have had some form of cyber attack over the past 12 months or over the year of, of 23. Um, about this is about 75 percent of these organisations have also had one the previous year. So potentially there's that can show things just around budget constraints or, or knowledge gaps or equally, as we all know, we're in a market, um, you know, the cybersecurity market is zero unemployment realistically, right? Everyone's just hopping from job to job for, um, you know, more salary or more responsibility. And it, it makes it, it makes it so hard for, you know, your your teams and your your companies to keep up with that that churn in, in this area because of the skills required. Um, and then equally, you know, the, the, always the scary number is that 90% of most attacks are, are via email, right? So I guess the best place for us to, 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 to start, especially as we have Ed from Proofpoint on the call, is around um, things such as um, ransomware, business email compromise, and, um, you know, the phishing in general, right? So um ed would you like to maybe chat a little bit around sort of what what we're seeing from cyber criminal gangs currently uh, in the market i will and as you kind of alluded to there it, it's going to be a little bit boring <clears throat> because not that much has changed and i predict that not that much will change next year i just wanted to reiterate what you said jake about if people want to ask questions feel free to to put them into chat into the question box and uh, make this interacting interactive I challenged my team uh, earlier in the year to try and run a whole, uh, to try and go a whole month without slides and and just talk to people because I think it's it's hopefully more interesting. So fingers crossed we'll we'll be doing the same here. But back to the point, things will remain the same. Ransomware, BEC fraud. We know from uh, the figures from the FBI that uh, ransomware, successful ransomware campaigns, and successful BEC campaigns account for the vast majority of financial losses that that organisations are seeing uh, from cybercrime, and that number increases year on year because it works. Ransomware works, BEC attacks work, 
the whole sort of approach of social engineering um, works. We know from years ago, the, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain, uh, we, we call that the attack chain at Proofpoint, is a standard path that criminal gangs use. They'll start off by trying to understand who their target is, do some investigation, get access, move laterally within that organization, and then perform whatever attack uh, uh, they want to do. And more often than not, that starts with an email. Why email? Because people work with email day in, day out. It's a channel that has to be open. It's a channel that can be easily um, manipulated at times. You know, uh, SMTP doesn't, the, the S in SMTP doesn't stand for secure, right? So the need you need to put in place uh, tools to secure that. You need to raise awareness with users, but they don't always work. So it, it's it's the most effective way for, for criminals to, to gain that uh, initial foothold. From there, one of the things that has changed in the last three or four years, uh, and will continue to, and we will continue to see next year, is that they're actually more sophisticated than they ever were before. These attacks in the past, ransomware, someone would see a link in a message, click on that link and boom, or there'd be an attachment, they'd click on that attachment and bang, there'd be ransomware. Now we're seeing more multi-stage attacks, much more sophisticated, where an initial downloader will be installed, that downloader will sit and wait and watch and feedback, then maybe a th another uh, piece of malware will be deployed to actually perform the ransomware attack. And, and prior to the ransomware uh, attack being, um, being launched, the criminals would have gained uh, access via a compromised identity, possibly. They'll be in there disabling backups or manipulating data so that all of the mitigate or many of the mitigation tools that an organization may have in place to protect themselves from ransomware aren't effective. Uh, for example, um, <coughs> we saw one, one criminal gang put their uh, ransomware code into the uh, sort of the GPU policy. So every time machines got re-imaged, the ransomware would be installed as part of that general policy, so that global policy. It's, it, it's interesting, the sophisticated level. And not all stages of those multi-stage attacks are, uh, are going to be perpetrated by the same criminal gangs. We see things like um, initial access brokerage as a service. So criminals are out there compromising people using the phishing messages or whatever to to gain access to those credentials and then selling that off for or selling access to the to compromised machines for other criminal gangs to go and do as they yeah. please yeah it's 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 um i guess that's that's where organized crimes move now right it's not just the whole someone stolen the credit card so they can get you know they can get done for stealing the credit card and then it's whoever they sell that credit card to who goes and you know spends all the money and, and is the you know the person doing the most fraud it's now we've gained access to customers or to companies to their environments and now we're there you know selling selling an exploit i mean i think it was back in in june or july this year we obviously saw that that terrible one with the um barts nhs where so you know they they managed to extract some crazy like seven i think seven or eight terabytes of sensitive data so clearly they you know they were in the network for a very long time extracting data you know very slowly and then and it ends in a ransomware attack and um i guess then again the the, the scary things also come from how do, how do you deal with the ransomware attack right we can obviously yes we can put in place um you know next generation antivirus and things like that but where companies may not have those sort of you know those um safeguards in place a lot of the time there it's just uh roll to you know roll to backup and and I think of some crazy like 70% of, of backups now are getting compromised as well. And obviously then, you know, you're losing days, weeks of work, which which equally um, is, is another sunken cost. Right. And then with with obviously more and more, more and more compliances coming in, you know, part of those compliances is sometimes cyber assurance and the, the insurance companies are obviously just going to pump your premiums up the more and more this happens. Right. So um, it's almost like we need some some collective. Uh, you know, collective action, if you like, to make sure everyone can be as secure as possible, so, so the insurance companies can't can't keep pumping everyone's premiums up. That's true, and that, and that you know, raises a couple of points that uh, I think are interesting. Firstly, around backup, you know, it's it's an old 
it's a bit of a cliche, but how often do people test and check their backups and restoration uh, of those backups, the restore part of that? It, it's not as often as people like to think. And that ties into a, a more important uh, part of the conversation around, you know, you mentioned uh, antivirus products. We, we, I work for a vendor. We talk about products. It's my job to talk about products. I'm not going to do that today. But unless organizations have a proper policy in place that is backed up, supported by leadership, board, whatever, then you know, you, you're going to be on a bit of a road to, to nowhere. And, and having that policy is, is key. We often talk about um, various regulations, PCI, DSS, amongst others, which are a great basis for a policy but shouldn't be used to replace a policy and you know, every organization should really have a have a program have a plan have a have a have a security policy yeah and then equally I, I think the most important thing is these strategies need to um be published obviously into the businesses themselves but also promoted right so it's what happens when a, a user does come into contact with say a phishing email or you know or they've had a, a physical intrusion or something like that they notice someone you know who's, who's in the office that they've they've never noticed before and you know they're going around talking to people or you know they've sat at a desk you know there's, a, there's some crazy stories you can read online of sort of you know um pretend like you belong, turn up in a high-vis jacket and uh, no one's going to ask you a question and, and, and things like that. So that's, uh, that's just another point that I guess the, these gangs are doing that on, on day, you know, daily as well. And it's something that, again, is, is never sort of thought about. But more and more with, obviously, I guess, uh, the sort of digital um, you know, footprint network, expanding networks, you've also got to then worry, I guess, about your supply chain, which is another another area we can also discuss um you know regarding all this and obviously nist has frameworks around how you should vet your suppliers and and things like that but it's never it's never as easy as do you know do you hit that idc um one two three four or or however the the, the framework goes these days um so we've seen obviously really high profile ones like solar winds back in uh, 2019 2020 and um, i think that's obviously becoming more and more common and especially when we move to SaaS sas models we move to bias pas we move to managed services and um, you know to fill some of these skill gaps that we alluded to earlier i guess ed how important do you think that um you know making sure your supply chain is is secured and and, and you know vetted and and make sure you have a strategy around who you're onboarding how you're onboarding them and and the like how you know how key is that to to you know customers businesses today that's really key but before we before we do that i just saw there was a question from uh mr plant Sorry. in the in the uh question tab about with compromise of backups becoming more commonplace is it approaching time to review traditional backup methods that's i think that's a great question if you don't mind jake we just um just jump in on that yeah. because I think the, the the traditional backup methods are are moving into more cloud based anyway, but I th I think that with the cloud and we'll come on to this later on as part of the DLP story as well. There's a there's a sometimes a bit, a bit ah, sometimes a bit of an assumption that it will just take care of itself, and even though there are policies and procedures put in place for backups and restoration, they're potentially being ignored a little bit because they're new they're in the cloud it should be easier and maybe we've automated it and the automation isn't being checked isn't being managed isn't being monitored so i think the traditional approach that the policy in terms of having a backup checking the backup validity and being able to make sure that it's not easily tampered with and that it can be restored successfully that remains the same the changes from on-prem to cloud, however, I think bring a lot of benefits, but the, and the, the policy just needs to be aligned with that move to the cloud. I think that, that would be my opinion on that. Yeah, and I, I would also agree in um, just also the, the flip side to that is then making sure that potentially you have a good software and asset management um, sort of capability as well, right? Because obviously where we move to, to SaaS and, um, you know, other other sources like that, then data is everywhere, right? So it's just also making sure that you actually know what you're backing up when you're backing it up and making sure that that, that policy, retention policy, whether it be the sort of, you know, 
was it son, father, grandfather method, or, or however you, you would like to do that is across your entire estate, right? Because it will just be that, um, and, and equally making sure that you have visibility and security in, in place across that entire estate, right? And um, so that, you know, you might not get a compromise when it comes to the backup of your O365 environment, but if it's to do with your, um, you know, your SQL server or something that's hosting a, you know, a legacy application, then, you know, you need to make sure that you can actually restore that as well. But with the move to more sort of single pane of glass uh, solutions, um, then yeah, I'd say it's it's definitely something worth reviewing, but uh, equally making sure you have a consistent methodology across your entire in environment. Um, but there's always going to be a place for tape, right? Some people still use it and they probably always will. So, uh, you know, it's always good to have a physical copy if, if you do need one as well. Definitely. So, um, thanks for that, Joe. Back to your question on supply chain. Okay, supply chain is a huge problem. You, know, you mentioned solar winds compromised tools compromised software those those threats i think will we're going to see more of that over the next over the next year we've seen it quite a bit this year um, and last and last year that's that's going to be a big area um, whether it's certificate compromises and um or, or whatever introduced we, we've seen um oh mgm really that was that was uh, Compromise really as a result of unfortunately Okta um, being uh, being compromised there. So it's going to happen. It's going to keep happening. We'll also see the supply chain being used um, where, uh, as a result of their potential weaknesses, and used to target organisations where there's more internal internal or, or um, external facing security, which is harder for for a um, for a criminal gang to breach. Instead, they will breach the low-hanging fruit who have relationships, direct relationships with their intended target, and they will try and break in through that way. Mm. Just uh, years ago, years ago, a, um, a friend of mine had a, a cheap old banger of a car. I remember he parked outside my house and we went to the pub. And he stayed over. We woke up the next day and he, um, his car had been stolen. He Initially, he was over the moon that someone thought his car was, was of sufficient value to steal. And then the police came around and said that his car had been used to ram raid a garage up the road and someone had stolen a proper car and just left his hanging out the window. And that's the kind of thing we're still seeing. We're seeing now with, with criminal gangs. They're targeting small organisations with no or limited security, compromising an account and then abusing that trusted relationship that that account has with the actual target. Yeah. Okay, so I guess yeah, the, bo the bottom line of it is obviously make sure that you do have the correct policies in place to protect yourself from, well, your suppliers, right? At the end of the day, you need to keep keep your network separate, but equally make sure that you're enforcing, uh, you know, audits and, and the like on them. And, you know, the, the, any, obviously, if they've got any um, qualifications, you know, CE plus and things like that, then then great, but definitely vet your vet your suppliers as um you, at the end of the day, if it's your if if it's a breach of your data, you're on the hook. That's the, the worst thing about this, right? Definitely. And you know, it might not be that the a supplier has been compromised. It might be that they've not got something as simple as DMARC uh, authentication set up. So having having simple things like that uh, or requiring your supply chain to set up simple things like that that are of you know don't cost that much a little bit complex perhaps but not not too bad enforcing dmark authentication prevents a lot of the spoofing that might take place and again just makes it that much more difficult and we'll see in in 2024 as google and yahoo both enforce or require that level of authentication um you know, i expect adoption to to increase on, on that front as, as um you know a lot of that b2c and even B2B communications will be done via, via certainly Google. Mm. Yeah, no, a very good point. And um, the other one is PCI DSS for that as well, requires it from, from 2025. So, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully where some of these governing bodies can, I guess, bring in, bring in regulation to, to, you know, help you fight your own corner, I guess, in that, in that scenario is, is only going to be for, for the, well, for the best of, of us all, right? Yeah, and and the other the other side of that is the is the kind of the social engineering. A lot of these attacks mm. start with a bit of social engineering. People are, are people want to be helpful most of the time. People want to work with folk. Yeah. Um, one of the one of the areas of growth in terms of the threat landscape we've seen in the last 
last year, and we expect to see more of this, is, is what, we, what we call TOADS, Telephone Orientated uh, Attack Delivery System, where there's no URL, there's no malware, there's just a call to action in an email and a phone number to ring. And of course, on the other end of that phone number is a, is a, a, a criminal, someone yeah. who will guide you to somewhere on the web, ask you to download something or, or simply pay some money into something. And uh, you know, pe people trust messages. For the last sort of decade or more, we've been telling people, don't trust a link, phone the person instead. So they're yeah. doing what we told them. And, and you know, it's just a great example of how, how the criminal gangs are adapting and responding to the security measures that, that we put into place. Yeah, people's people's good nature. Obviously, the uh, best way to do it is to is to well educate, right? <laughs> Where I guess this leads very nicely into the the, the how data is lost, right? And 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 generally, it is it is that social engineering. It's those end users. You know, we. We live in a in a bubble myself and, and you Ed and, and probably the people on this call where uh, you know I I have a password manager for example that has every single one of my passwords whether it's banking through to you know uh, just just logging on to the yellow pages or, or whatever I can't think of an example but something you know very nonchalant and you know I back that up two times I change it every month and in fact you know I, I had my phone my uh, my mobile phone stolen and it was you know it was easy for me luckily because all I did was wipe the phone and I had all of my personal data stored and knew exactly what I needed to swap out and things like that right so there's the the, the terminology negligent user I always I I, I I say I take offense to slightly because it never is uh, it's it's the term that we've adopted right but it's not really the case of someone unintentionally doing something who you know generally either doesn't understand the long-term implications or hasn't been taught what the long-term implications are right we've uh, you know some people have been have been lucky to grow up with a with a mobile phone in their hand other people you know it's been it's been writing right but the people that grow up with a mobile phone in their hand take everything for granted and some people just haven't been educated right so we we live in a world where we call it negligence but it's purely the fact that that sometimes we we haven't been taught right we haven't been taught that you know the qr phishing is a, is a prime example right that's that's obviously the new big thing i you know my girlfriend my friends look at me very strangely when we go to you know uh, all the pubs do it nowadays right you don't have people come to serve you you scan your qr code so i get there and i scrape at the table a bit just to make sure someone's not put a sticker over it and i'm you know i'm going to be redirected and, and things like that so the term negligent user is obviously that will be used because that's 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 the term right but i do i do somewhat take offense at it because i feel like it's usually just we've not done enough to to educate those people but um you know back back to my point we're seeing users, um, you know, everyone's be best intention generally, right? You always see the good in people. So it, it is surprisingly easy, I guess, for you to be drawn down that path of, you know, can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? Through means that aren't email, right? When you get an email, you might have a flag, a banner saying, this is outside your organization, please think. When you get a text message or you scan a QR code or you get a phone call, that's where, you know, we need to start thinking about how do you, educate end users right they're always going to be the problem and um, so i think the most important thing for me with, with negligent users is not is not just classifying them as a problem it's just making sure that you start talking about you know obviously there's programs and things that will help them with this but you start talking about hygiene and security hygiene you just make it second nature to these people because it will help them in their personal lives as well right especially the i get all the time on my personal number you know whatsapps from all around Asia and things, obviously asking to talk to me and, and things like that. And it's just something that we just have to learn to live with now, very sadly, that we have to learn to live with cybercrime. It sounds very similar to, to the sort of COVID argument, right? But that's just how it is. And we need to educate ourselves, but also we need help in, you know, from, from HR departments and things and being educated as to how to avoid these, you know, these, these issues. And then, you know, that gives, if if we can if we can sort of you know knock knock that nail on the head then that gives you know the, the people in this this chat and um you know vendors like yourself and managed service providers the chance to focus on the malicious users right and focus on cracking down on those criminal gangs so i guess ed do you have any top tips for um that was a very long introduction to saying <laughs> do you have any top tips for sort of getting around this negligent user um sort of fiasco yeah. if you like so i think that there's there's a couple of a couple of points that I want to to address there. So the, the the first thing is we've got this idea of a user profile of a negligent user, 
but we also want to look at the other types of profiles so we, we you know think you've got compromised users we talked a lot a, a few moments ago about uh, accounts being compromised so you've got the genuine account but that account's been compromised and that compromise has led to someone accessing data who shouldn't be okay and then you've also got the notion of malicious users someone who actually isn't a negligent user but could be accessing the same sort of data that a negligent user is so how do we differentiate between those how do we build out a profile how do we understand the true intent and once we know the intent we can build out an action plan for a negligent user absolutely you want to coach you want to help them you want to help them understand of course you want a training program in advance before that uh, with malicious users you, know, you want the evidence to take action whether that's legal action whether it's just uh, hr action and with compromised accounts you want to kick them out you want to reset passwords you want to understand what access they've had so far what have they done with that data because you know, as, as we say at, at proofpoint data doesn't just get up and walk out of the door on its own it requires interaction with people more often than not so that that's key making that more difficult has been you mentioned covid briefly but that, that's had an impact it's speeded up this process of people working from anywhere on data that is stored everywhere so how do you keep a track of how that data is being accessed who's accessing it how are they accessing it what rights to access are on those uh, are on those various files so we've got a, a combination of different types of people accessing the data but also the concern about misconfiguration of cloud services it's very easy for people to assume in the past that my data is on our network it's safe because it's internal and with this great move to the cloud this sort of digitization of everything that's no longer the case and people are sharing things there's there's a huge potential for overshare of a document you know, many of the default options are just share with everybody or people are just sharing this link with anyone who you know, uh, share this file with anyone who has the link it's easily it's easily done and, and having again it, it, it's not products it's having a policy it's having a program in place to understand where your data is what you need to protect and what are the rules around the access and then being able to manage that but as i said at the beginning my um long again spiel um when it comes to those users it's context what is the user trying to do and what are they trying to access and understanding that will help you deal with with any problems and also it kind of gives a bit of a let off for the negligent user and they get into a bit less if you've got someone who's just trying to access data send it home to their um to their home email account because they want to do work over the weekend you know it's hard to punish someone for that because they're, they're doing their best but you need to give them a warning and, and just say you know this isn't how we how we look after data yeah no it makes perfect sense i think this is obviously a conversation that that extends slightly outside of just the security teams and the um you know the it teams themselves right so um obviously yes it's going to fall to security and it always will to say monitor logins like we said from from various locations at strange times of night you know to do uh, strange file sends and things like that but equally um you know while you're on calls with these people um do they have any sort of erratic or unusual behavior and and that that those types of telling signs as well are they trying to cover something up you know if you ask them a question that might have been you know too close to home if you like of, of what they're what they're thinking about doing with their ulterior motives these you know these malicious or, or insiders if you like and then that sort of falls onto hr right to go and you know do a little bit of investigation into that side and and equally you know part of this comes in the recruitment and hiring stage you know you have to some some jobs um obviously there's in, in you know government public sector and things you'll have specific requirements especially in, in in government around clearances and things like that but you have to make sure that you know you are screening your candidates very very strongly nowadays right because um again with with su such you know in, in certain um roles with there being so so little unemployment that you know if someone has been let go for a certain reason we've seen some horrible cases of it of it recently not not necessarily in it but been let go from other areas and get a job somewhere else and cause an absolute comeuppance comeuppance in a new in a new business or a new um you know new new entity if you like so equally part of that is monitoring behavior but monitoring their persona as well right and that 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 shouldn't fall onto the 
the IT team. So like you said, you need a strategy in place to, uh, you know, look after your users as well. And but equally, you know, monitor those who, who might be up to no good. Very much, very much the case. And interesting, combining the last two topics, we've been talking about data loss and, and the threats. It, you're absolutely right. That falls not, not just into the lapse of security and IT. This is all part of risk management and appetite for risk and understanding an organization's exposure to risk, uh, which again lies with executive leadership, board level, and um, and that that really needs to to drive budgets, drive programs, and um, and, and really be in that position to understand what risks a business is prepared to take as part of its business as usual program. Yeah, yeah. So I was just looking at the time. I mean, I think that's a nice a nice summary of, of sort of the, the top two topics, if you like. So in short, cybersecurity uh, needs have not have not changed. Uh, just malicious actors have got well, they've become better at what they do, right? They've had more time to practice. They've started selling with services. We see uh, state-sponsored attacks. We see, you know, groups groups of hackers uh, that, that would have been, you know, lone, lone wolves, if you like, now now teaming up and, and working together. Um, and then equally, you know, data is all about making sure that the users that interact with that data, um, you know, are, are classified correctly. Um, and, that, and then protections can obviously be put in place because of that. Um, however, you know, it always helps if you've got trained users and, and good users <laughs> from day one, right? So um, I think obviously most people are probably here for the, the this part of the conversation. So uh, Ed, as you gave me a, a great little a great little fact earlier, I'll let you let you introduce the uh, artificial intelligence side. <laughs> well, it, it is the it's the topic of the year, isn't it? And um, yeah, we had Collins Dictionary a few weeks ago say that their word of the year was AI artificial intelligence, but it was AI. And then just today, um, the Cambridge Dictionary's word of the year is hallucinate, uh, but not hallucinate in the term of um, sort of medical or drug induced visions. It, it's to do with hallucinate and AI, where um, where AI gets things wrong. And as a, as a result of its sort of processes and workings, it comes up with false false statistics, false statements or whatever. And um, I think I just thought that was that was so interesting and so relevant to today because AI is going to both benefit us and also you know, be a threat, be a challenge. And, and I'm going to split those into, into two areas at the moment. Firstly, why has it become so topical? You know, AI has been around since the 40s or 50s. You know, in the in the 1950s, I think the, the US Postal Service was using artificial intelligence to help them process zip codes to, to expedite the you know, the delivery of, of snail mail, of, of post. Uh, so why has it become more of a um, more of a topic this year than ever before? Because of the LLMs, the large language modules, and uh, because of the gener generative AI, the generative artificial intelligence that we've heard so much about. And again, both of those will pose um, post threats and challenges. From a defense perspective, of course, the the ability to use those large uh, language models is going to help us process um, the, the, the huge volumes of, of data that we get, the, the, the threat intelligence that we see, that all securities will see. Proofpoint in particular sees huge amounts of this, trillions of, of nodal points every year. It allows us to feed that information into our artificial intelligence engines into the um, we'll build a pipeline of that data the, the we can build reiterations of the models uh, build and reiterate the models that, that we learn that feed back into into products to help us detect and respond to particular incidents so that's that's without a doubt it is going to help defend against these threats significantly mm. okay um, it allows us to understand behavior uh, it understands how people are interacting with one another. So we can see if, uh, say, Jake, you and I have an email exchange and, and I suddenly yeah. try to send something off to another Jake at a different company, it knows that something's wrong. Or if there's a shift in the pattern of the language that we're using or a big shift suddenly to yeah. uh, a financial conversation when that wouldn't normally happen. Um, AI allows us to understand that. And that's something we've been doing for, for quite a long time in the industry. But it's getting better and better and better. So 
being able to understand that, that sort of behavioral side of things allows us to address that particular vulnerability. What it will also do though, it will also help us automate simple tasks. You mentioned at the beginning that there, there's such a shortage of IT of security people in the industry that being able to simplify and, and automate tasks will, will help reduce the burden on them, it makes jobs more interesting, gets rid of some of the some of the more onerous jobs. <clears throat> the other thing, as I mentioned there, is simplification. What generative AI will do in terms of security will allow um, various products, services to take a lot of data, pass it, and simplify it with an output that is intelligible to you know, non-security personnel. It becomes meaningful. <clears throat> and AI will be very will be instrumental in making making security tools just more simpler to use. Again, helping address that problem with shortage in um, uh, in personnel. So th th those are some of the advantages from a defensive perspective. No, interesting. But um, and it's interesting that almost everything that you've just said you can flip on its head and uh, <laughs> and say these can also be the reasons that, that that i guess businesses need to take more uh you know maybe more precautions in right i mean there obviously with the llms the large language models um we're starting to see that with um i think there was one one that came out the other day um from the fbi um with just the scale of attacks that can happen are coming and they're coming at a speed that you know no no one has ever seen before but equally they're very complex and it's also adding a you know they've got a a commander general on their shoulder almost like a you know like a, a napoleon or a, or someone like that from back in the day because they're also putting in data around sort of geopolitical tensions right so you know a perfect time would have been obviously the russian ukraine war there is also launched at the same time a lot of cyber attacks you know sometimes completely unrelated but obviously one news and media and people and you know the 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 central um you know like the secret service of said countries are off you know doing their investigation or planning and things like that then companies you know countries are getting hit by cyber attack companies are getting hit by cyber attacks because everywhere else you know your head's elsewhere right the news is all about other things um you know i i imagine it was the same in same in this country obviously when when the when the wars hit and things like that you would obviously everything was thrown the government was thrown that way you know the secret service was thrown that way the army was thrown that way so then all of a sudden there's a spike right and these 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 criminal gangs we talked about earlier are using ai as almost like a master and commander scenario where they are you know using it to process news data as well right so you know it could be that there's some small town in you know in america in 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 wyoming or wherever where there's been you know a a drugs bust or something like that perfect time for someone to you know try and launch a launch a cyber attack on the local bank or something like that right so they are using it as yeah a, you know a general which is also very scary to say that they they have you know a, a player who, you know, well it started with chess right we all learned about ai when when it started winning games of chess and go so imagine what it can do from a, an organized crime perspective and it goes back to that social engineering, you know, um, when you can very quickly build out, let's say, an email. We, we identified earlier that email is the, the number one source of attacks. When you're sending out an email, criminal gangs can use all of that information and just quickly send out messages using AI in language yeah. that's going to be meaningful. Uh, and that could be in, in English, in French, in German, whatever. Mm -hmm. Send those messages out that encourages people to interact with it because it's language that they will be engaged with, they will be interested in. And, mm. and the ability to do this on a much broader scale, on a more automated scale, will be a real advantage to, to the attackers, to, the, to these criminal gangs. And, and we will see this now. We have already seen it in spam, in phishing, in ransomware, in all these lures. AI using all that information that it has to create content that will be interesting and accurate most of the time accurate remember that hallucinate term uh, where sometimes <laughs> that's that uh, inaccuracies but hey you know people are people are prepared to believe it and, and it takes yeah. a bit of research to, uh, to find it's not so yes that will be that'll be um that, that's going to be a key challenge similarly we're going to see ai used to create um you know, deep fakes and, and, more, attempts, more, yeah. and more personalized messages that are really convincing yeah. And that that's going to be going to be a challenge. 
yeah the veracity of of some of these things not not only can um can be challenging but it takes up time and effort too so uh, that that's that's going to be that's going to be tricky the the other thing is as organizations increasingly embrace artificial intelligence that opens up some different types of attack vectors so uh, criminal gangs may try to um steal data so you know if people are, are putting up questions or uh, putting up code to check it into various ai machines exposing it to to the public domain uh, which is yeah. a, a threat but then there's the reverse of that if um, if there's something that's open that criminals can get access to they can manipulate that data they can possibly poison the source and and have they um the the generative ai push out misleading information on purpose as a result of their data poisoning so, so some interesting interesting mm -hmm. areas for attack that go beyond that simple sort of generative ai to create messages to um, to abusing how organizations are are using artificial intelligence uh, to um to manipulate them yeah i think the the impersonation thing is is key um we've obviously seen it a lot we see it a lot on tv right we've seen harrison ford play you know, from a deep fake perspective play indiana jones both as a an 80 year old man and <laughs> and someone in his in his 30s 40s and but then, and but then, there's been some horrible cases recently with with people getting phone calls um, around kidnappings and stuff like that. You know, we've got people out on social media exists, right? And, you know, general media exists. It's very easy for someone now to get someone's voice or you know image and likeness. Um, so I imagine you know the next types of uh, heists, if you like, heist movies now will just be someone sitting at home, you know, doing that old. Tom Cruise, Mission Impossible, voice changer type, you know, type type scenario, and and just just asking for money a lot of the time. You know, we've seen people that have been in car crashes, having to pay medical bills, and and everything like that, just because there is generally a way to find your voice or likeness. But then the other thing that I always find interesting, and this is where you will have to layer security, is everyone's moved to MFA, you know, multi-factor authentication. A lot of the time, it'll be your password and some kind of biometric, you know if now you can't use your face because your face can be put on such a you know an image uh, or, so, or or something like that or put onto someone else's body if you can't use your your voice because your voice can be you know modulated somewhere else um or you know it, it can very easily probably extend expand to extend to fingerprinting and you know um 3d printing and, and things like that with the way we're going we're almost going to get to a point where you're going to be at like an MFA, 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 and then the whole reason that we have multi-factor authentication in the first place and single sign-on was to stop people having fatigue around security. So um, now, where you're basically saying you might have to authenticate three or four times um, for it to actually be you, especially if you're a person of you know high esteem, or, you know, a target, a CEO, someone like that. Um, I think it'll be very interesting to see, and there probably is the answer out there or being worked on. How maybe some of these authentication services and and things like that or, or authentication strategies may need to change you know over the next few years whether we go back to the whole you know you have your asset management catalog if it's not on that catalog and it comes through your firewall we kick it off you know do we move that's where the zero trust sort of initiatives are going right so it'll be interesting to see is that going to accelerate this sort of principle of least privilege zero trust network adoption purely because things like multi-factor authentication may not well do its task anymore because of this this the, the easy access of things like deep deep fakes and voice modulation technology i think it's even simpler than that with mfas you know they're, they're being compromised daily but um mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's uh yeah zero access least access is is a <laughs> is a very interesting topic perfect so yeah and i think as i say i think um you know i've i've come to come to an end of of, of sort of the topics i had at mind i don't know ed if there's any more that, you, that, that you've thought about anything else that you'd like to yeah. share Just some one more, thoughts on? one more thought on that on that zero access and 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 this comes into again a comment you, you briefly mentioned on when security gets in the way of being able to do business properly security fails 
okay it, it becomes a barrier to work and, and that's what we always need to to keep in the back of our minds that security isn't an end in itself it it, it helps support the end in itself i remember being at a conference once and uh, and one of the presenters likened it to a seatbelt in a car or good brakes in a car they're not there to make you stop um, they're there to help you go faster more securely and um, yeah, like with, with zero trust again if you make that too difficult and you can't access what you need when you need to security fails you when um, anything gets in the way of you of your BAU it's a problem because people complain people will get unruly people will find a way around it and then your security will fail and, and again that's that's a problem mm, that's that's actually that's a really good point and that's one of the things that I would recommend um obviously something that, that that you could get help with um whether it be one of your providers or, or consultants but equally something i think all businesses should do is a voice of the user type um you know a scenario or voice of the customer if you like a lot of the time when when a business is you know functioning and and, and doing its day-to-day -day, sometimes the the it staff the security staff the you know the hr staff the business process staff don't don't actually think to just ask their end users are they happy with their experience right so things like how do how do end users interact with you know their 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 tools whether it be their collaboration tools or you know their security tools and things it's a, re it's a really good initiative just to uh, just to ask ask your end users right for that feedback because um, the, the the time that a security breach could happen could be when someone is getting upset with with the MFA or the amount of times they have to log in or not being able to access the documents they need to do their work and then they find a route around it right and then you've got a effectively an escalated privilege account within the uh, within the um, your your company that could become compromised as well right so I'd say that's that's another thing that 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 I would obviously always recommend someone to do is just ask your users how their you know their end user experience is right and, and equally that it prevents any sort of disgruntled you know uh, employees as well at the same time yep agreed and and just tied into that educating users a lot of it is so much around a lot of security is around educating users people are the last line of defense and the first line of of, of, of targets for for criminals it, it all starts with the user this notion of uh, of people-centric security yeah, you know, it, it's a thing. It's a real thing, and um, yeah, that, that's that's building a policy around people is an essential part of any enterprise security program uh, in today's uh, environment. Perfect. Thank you, Ed. Any any other points that we that we may not have covered off today? Not from my end, and uh, I can only see one other comment in the questions asking whether. Um, they can get access to the recording but i will yep. leave that one yeah we'll make sure so i guess i'll do a final wrap up so um you know as you're as you're all aware um having worked with works with ultima ultima obviously as a managed services um provider um we've got services ranging from security networks uh, workspace uh, cloud and data center infrastructure right so anything we talked about today um, you know, if you'd like to, to talk to an expert about it or get any, um, you know, have any suggestions or, or do a, you know, a, a paper around around anything that's 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 needed, then please do uh, get in touch with your account manager or, you know, you can you can hit me up on LinkedIn, um, Jake Upfield, and I'll happily take a take a message and, you know, we can we can book a time to to talk further. And um, we, you know, again, work with with Proofpoint from a from an email perspective, but you know have a have a lot of holistic managed services around around security in general and equally work with with sort of all major technologies as well and, and some niche players that that, that that might fit and add value to your business um, and we can also help with any sort of strategy um you know documentation or anything like that that we've also alluded to today so it doesn't matter where you are on your security journey uh whether it be you know you're a a startup greenfield site or you know or you've been going for, for 40 odd years and and you just want someone to sort of come in and do a bit of a you know a sanity check and uh, sort of show where they might be able to add some value or help identify your attack surface you know ultima is the place to the place to come and you know we, we can obviously help with that 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 path whether you're you know wherever you are in your sort of current operating model towards you know your future operating model and ed would you like to say a few words 
Um, thanks, Jake, for organising this. Thank you to the Ultima team uh, and for all the attendees. Thank you so much. If you'd have preferred slides, let us know. Personally, <laughs> without slides, but uh, always happy to take feedback on that front. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. So I'll end I'll end the webinar now. But thank you very much for attending. And please do if you do have any questions, we'll obviously send out the we'll get this webinar sent out to the attendees. Um, but you please uh, please do add me on LinkedIn or you know reach out to your account manager and put some books and time in. Cheers.